Hello, I'm Rosa DeLauro, United States Congresswoman from Connecticut's 3rd District. I'm delighted to join with the Beinecke Library at Yale University to bring you a reading of an essential text of our nation's history, the heroic Declaration of Sentiments, set forth at the First Women's Right Convention at Seneca Falls, New York, July 19th through 20th, 1848. The Declaration was signed by 62 women and 28 men who knew that the time is always right to stand up for justice. Frederick Douglass was one of the signers of the Declaration of Sentiments, and it was first printed at his North Star Press. He described it as the, and I quote, grand movement for attaining the civil, social, political, and religious rights of women. It is especially meaningful to consider these words this year. This is the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, an achievement made possible because of the hard work and organizing from the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 down to 1920. This is a year when millions of Americans are standing up, speaking out, and marching against racism, with women of color leading the way in the essential and ongoing work to build a more perfect union. This is a year when the right to vote is under threat, especially in low-income communities and communities of color. This is a year when we are reckoning with the past in the present to forge a better future. As we work to build a more perfect union, let us take inspiration and sustenance from those whose hard work and organizing made progress possible in the past. History is ours to know, and history is ours to make. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of those who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to effect their safety and happiness. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their duty thro to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under this government, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward woman. Having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. 
he has withheld from her rights, which are given to the most ignorant and degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Having deprived her of this first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has oppressed her on all sides. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. He has taken from her all right in property, even to the wages she earns. He has made her morally an irresponsible being, as she can commit many crimes with impunity, provided they be done in the presence of her husband. In the covenant of marriage, she is compelled to promise obedience to her husband, he becoming, to all intents and purposes, her master, the law giving him power to deprive her of her liberty and to administer chastisement. He has so framed the laws of divorce as to what shall be the proper causes of divorce, in case of separation, to whom the guardianship of the children shall be given, as to be wholly regardless of the happiness of women, the law in all cases, going upon the false supposition of the supremacy of man and giving all power into his hands. And depriving her of all rights as a married woman, if single and the owner of property, he has taxed her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it. He has monopolized nearly all of the profitable employments and from those she is permitted to follow. She receives but a scanty remuneration. He closes against her all of the avenues to wealth and distinction, which he considers most honorable to himself. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. He has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education all colleges being closed against her. He allows her in church as well as state, but a subordinate position, claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry and with some exceptions from any public participation in the affairs of the church. He has created a false public sentiment by giving to the world a different code of morals for men and women, by which moral delinquencies which exclude women from society are not only tolerated, but deemed of little account in man. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign for her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and her God. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Now, in view of this entire disenfranchise of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we must insist that they have immediate admission to all of the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of these United States. In entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception misrepresentation and ridicule, but we shall use every instrumentality within our power to affect our object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press in our behalf. We hope this convention will be followed by a series of conventions embracing every part of the country, firmly relying upon the final triumph of the right and the true. We do this day affix our signatures to this declaration.